So what we try to do today, we, I will try to address where are we in the cycle, the real estate cycle and the other cycles. In order to do that, I've got three parts to the talk. First, I'll do a brief review about the 18 to 20 year real estate cycle. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about WD GAN's 18.6 year measurement. That might be new to some of you. And then I'm going to mention why I think the next cycle for Australia might even be bigger than the one we've just been through. In the US from 1800, as I learned, the United States came under a federal constitution. The first law they passed, naturally, was the selling of the real estate, which any US citizen could do. So after 1800, the US government started selling off its real estate to all its citizens. That graph records the number of public land sales in acres from 1800 to 1923 to US citizens. Now have a look at that. Every 18 years, almost precisely, there was a major boom in land speculation and then after that a major contraction and a downturn that put everybody out of work. I also found out when I was doing my studies very, very few, if any, economists actually get to understand how the economy truly works. So, to try and briefly extrapolate that point of view, economists delight in recalling the Dutch tulip mania of 1636, the South Sea bubble of the 1720s, in more recent times the internet bubble, because it, it's full of rogue characters and uh, awesome booms that turn, to, that turn eventually to bust. Those types of things, I feel, are, are, are random events. But the financial crisis that broke in 2007, that crisis is actually predetermined by the structure of the economy. So what you, what you can actually say is that crisis is actually written into the DNA of the economy. Therefore, when you get a boom and a bust, the way the economy is structured, underwritten as it is by the economic rent, the boom and the bust is actually proof to you that the system is working. So if you can look at the economy that way, then you might start to get into some decent research about why this might be happening. Now, I maintain that if you put land into the equation of, economy, of the economics, the economy does have, actually have a scientific foundation and it is based on the economic rent. The leading indicators that all the economists around the world, no one actually measures what I consider to be the real lead indicator, which is land price. And you'll notice that preceding every economic boom, at least going back, back to 1800 in the US, the land boom was always first. This was a concept first formalised by the English economist David Ricardo, and the economic rent is to economics what uh, gravity is to science. Now that led me to, after that, because my great passion and love is in forecasting, so it led me to formulate an econo uh, a real estate clock. The clock that most people would be familiar with is probably that one. Who's seen that decade clock mostly? Yeah, but that decade clock, it can't really tell you timing. And of course, what you might have noticed is that works, at, that allegedly has a 10 year time frame, eight to 11 years or so, but you would, most people would have, note, would have noticed already that the financial downturn that we had in the last year or two, it was actually nothing like the downturn that we had 10 years or eight years prior to that in 2001 after the internet bubble. That's because the downturn we've just had involved real estate and a real estate-led downturn is much different to the one that we get about every decade or so. So it's based on this particular clock. Now remember, why am I, why am I doing this? I'm doing this to give you a, an eight to 10 minute review of real estate because I want to try and show you where we are in the cycle. And then I want to try and show you why we're going to get asset bubbles forever, unless uh, something changes. So, I formulated that clock in 2005. It was based on the work of Roy Wensley, Homer Hoyt, and Fred Harrison. Particularly Homer Hoyt. If you read Homer Hoyt's 100, uh, 100 Years of Land Values in Chicago, you'll find that a lot of what Homer Hoyt had to say is I've put into that clock. And so you get that 18-year uh, cycle, and we're going, we're going essentially, if you can follow the 
the mouse I've got there, we're going from the, if you go from the beginning of the cycle, which is the downturn and the, the bottom, which is around 22, 23 o'clock, we then go around the inner, the inner circle, it takes about 8 to 11 years, we then move to 13, 14 o'clock, and we go around the outer circle until we get to the bust. Generally, that entire cycle has taken about 18 to 20 years. Since 1955, well actually the cycle in general is usually about 14 years up, four down. Since 1955, that's actually been, in the US, that's actually been very close to month perfect. 14 years up, four down. It becomes very hard, if I address audiences that have got economists in it, it becomes very hard for me to start suggesting that because academics and economists are, are taught, of course, that the world's pretty much random. Stock markets are random, built on Eugene Famer's thesis of, uh, of all the randomness, and it it's, uh, goes even way back before then to um, all, the, all the books that were written about the market being random. So I guess you could say in one sense, I get out, we're out on a bit of a limb here when we're trying to suggest that it isn't so random. I go through that in, in the book, which I think many of you would have read, to try and show you, actually let's go back just a little bit more. Notice when we are going around the clock, I'll just point out a couple of things there. You've got there one and two ready for the next boom, gross rents improve, net rents rise, the higher rents equals higher prices for established buildings, it's more profitable then to build and so on, expansion in construction and uh, expansion of banks and so on. Let me show you at least to show you that, that process has been going on for a long time now. I've got some figures which came out of the book. On the left hand side we've got the number of banks. That's the pink line. On the right hand side we are charting the loans outstanding which is the blue line. And can you notice that the two cycles we're dealing with here are from about 1820 to about 1840 at the bottom, and then from about 1840 to 1860 or so at the bottom. But can you see it's in the last, it's in the last couple of years of the real estate cycle, it's where the lending really gets <coughs> to extreme levels. Loans go over the top, the number of banks expands. You can see this particularly in the United States because throughout the Throughout the 1800s in the United States, just about anybody could own a bank or start one, so you didn't really need a license like you do today. So, when there's more demand for credit, that's what banks would do. Banks would spring up everywhere. But if you go back and, and you, you remember what we've just been through, you remember that really credit just went right out of hand from about after about 2001, 2002. And so that's what happens towards the end of the cycle. So that's trying to show you from the point of view of the cycle that's how the cycle moves. I put all that out for subscribers over many years, many of the emails that I did, and even back in January 2003, I was suggesting to all the people back then, the subscribers, the real estate cycle, and I know there's a few of you here, uh, would run the full 18 years again. At the time, just a lot of other people were suggesting things had peaked, but I just thought the 18 years would continue. That's the real estate, the real estate section covered. So that's the few minutes I wanted to spend there. <coughs>